And so the modern scientific tradition, ending with Hegel, says that the true and first instance of generation, or if we would describe a process, how do we describe a process? How, how do we describe a process that leads to a result? That leads to a conclusion. You know? If the conclusion is truly a process and the process is itself a result, like it's a thing that's enduring the process and the process itself results in things, they come out of it. If we say that, what is its nature? What is the behavior of that phenomenon? Whatever it may be, you can call it anything you want. You can call it God. You can call it man. You can call it the universe. You can call it substance, as the Greeks did. You can call it AI, as the postmodern we're alluding to with Heidegger. Whatever you want to call it, what is its behavior? And Hegel says, and he ultimately appropriated this idea from the Greeks, he said that whatever its nature may be, we can call its system and its behavior and its process dialectic. What, is, what are the implications of stating that the fundamental nature of the world is dialectical? What does that mean? You know, what, what does it mean? Okay. What it cannot mean, what it cannot mean, it cannot mean that the world is fundamentally random and that things are only bearing some kind of external interaction with each other and therefore the result is what is observed by the by the observer the phenomena is observed by the observer as just some kind of randomly occurring instances of possibilities each of which take on a quality and no and not any one quality is greater than any other quality <laughs> we cannot adopt this notion because even if we say that is the effect that is what we that is what our crude knowledge comes to bear it just like it that's the first recognition we can say it cannot be the final recognition because it cannot explain you see it cannot explain the cause to the effect it cannot explain okay where did you know okay two random things interacting with one another great okay um and they're happening to an observer okay so now we have three things we have a we have an, two objects, which is one thing. Uh, we have the relation between object, which is another thing. And then we have the observer, which is a third thing. So already we are in accordance with a tripartite interactions of different aspects of substance, different sides of substance. Or substance bear these particular characteristics that we can categorize into these personalities or forms, let's say, as the Greeks said. And so one form is that there are two objects, two or more objects, two or an infinite amount of objects. And that is one category because every single object is different from every other single object. That's the thing that, 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 that what, that's the thing they share. That's what makes them under that category is that they're all different from one another. Not one object is exactly the same as the other. And so in the dialectic, that would be... In, in our current academic field, we say it's the thesis, which I think it's a really poor characterization, and which Hegel never ultimately worded in that manner. Because a thesis just makes it seem it's just a, you know part of a, a rhetorical process of argumentation you know like that dialectic has this only human aspect of discourse in which how we 
come to bear and communicate with one another and reach conclusions, which is true. But it's also the most fundamental substance of how things are. Because we are also trying to characterize how the process is the result. You know, what is the character of the process? If it is indeterminate, if it is indeterminate, what is its character? And to assume that dialectic is at the fundamental nature of things, it is the essential nature, then we have then, then we cannot adopt another principle from the crude understanding of the world. I call it crude, and it's also the materialistic understanding of the world, the scientific materialistic in the academic sense, or just the postmodern notion of viewing nature, is that we cannot just assume there is no qualitative difference between the objects that constitutes the indeterminate differences that all objects share in a communion, sharing their common feature that they're all different from one another. There, always ha- there obviously have to be some kind of qualitative um, analysis as integrally related with the quantitative. In fact, if we propose that first it must be a quantitative analysis, the fact of being quantitative is itself the first quality. The first quality anything bears is that it is just a mere quantity, that it can be counted as one thing different from another. another. We didn't explain their difference because their difference is another category in dialectical knowledge. Their difference so first we had their com- communion, their, 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 you know, what makes them the same, which was the fact that they, there's nothing that makes them say they're just different. There's two different things, but now we're stuck. Okay, there's two different things and they are just floating um, against each other as just being different things. If, even if we assume that, then they're still interacting in that manner, maintaining themselves as two different things. So what caused the maintenance of themselves as two different things? What is the we you know what, what is the cause of that, and 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 the cause of that in dialectical knowledge is that the relation itself, the relation itself between any two or more objects, is itself more fundamental than the objects that constitute the relation. It's a very weird counterintuitive logic, you know. You you don't make the two objects that are different from each other first, you, what you make first is their actual interaction. And so a problem immediately arises with this claim is that, okay, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. So you have two things interacting, you removed both of these things and you kept their interaction. Where did you not get their interaction? You see, it goes into the derivative again, into, into an infinite regress. And you, you only end up in this train of thought if you don't see a progressive development in the process. If you see that the process has no aim, or telos, as the Greeks say, has no end in sight. When you, if you see the process in this way, that it has no end in sight and it's just aimlessly going nowhere, then, then yeah, you would always be looking for the cause of one thing over the other. But you'll never really understand a cause if you don't explain, if one thing led to the other, what did that thing do to the to the thing that it originated from? Okay. And so the Greeks said, there's generation and then there's alteration. Okay. Alteration is the physical quality of change in the same phenomena. The same phenomena itself is capable of alteration. If, if different things are capable of generation, each thing generates into being, each of those things in themselves are capable of alteration. They're capable of changing qualities. And so the quality itself is not the object that you would find immediately confronting your sense precepts, for example, your sense perception, or just your, you know, the phenomena to the observer. The phenomena to the observer is always inherently what it is not. <laughs> and so the observer is like, okay, well, then what is it, right? 
it's the very thing that it is not, which is which is what resulted in it. And so if it's and you see many different objects each coming into being, you realize, wait, it is each of those objects that are taking on a characteristic of some more inherently implicit fundamental being. And so in the dialectical knowledge, the characteristic of the process, giving it a spirit or a personality, okay, is that Hegel never used the thesis and then confronted with the antithesis and their interactions somehow result in a synthesis, which although is how the structure or the soundness of the argument is, it is sound, but it isn't necessarily valid. Or, or, or we could say it's valid and not sound because you could say, well, it's structured correctly, but it doesn't have the right content that necessitate an explanation of that structure. Like, okay, structured that way, but it's bare. So what is structured that way? A building? Okay, now we can apply. Now it's an actual architecture, you know? So, so the point is this. The process begins. It has a beginning, Hegel proposes. And that is its thesis. Its antithesis, which, which be, w w is actually, it's very advanced. It's very advanced away from its beginning. You can say anything going away from its beginning is going towards its end. And therefore, you ultimately, with the beginning presuppose, the end. The end was the very reason for the beginning. But how could it be if it comes after the beginning? It's because it comes after the beginning in a, trans, in a, in a linear state of time, one point transcending into another point, and then you have the length of the line as their interaction. So you have two points that are externally from one another and their internal relation is the line, is that they are still the same thing extended outwards of itself, spatially extended in our physical phenomena. phenomena. And temporally, well, that's the element of time that it is subject to. Um, so it's, there's a beginning, it advances, it remains itself, it never said it an antithesis isn't something else. It isn't a different object, for example. If you have the interaction of two objects, that is the beginning. That is what we see in the infinite convolution and flux of the first instance of consciousness, we could say, is that everything is convoluted, nothing is clear. And then it, it, and then it advances itself by clarifying these particular moments into discernible instances it can identify with itself. And then the synthesis is the end because the end was there from the very beginning it was the very reason why it came into being the very reason for its beginning not because it comes after the beginning but because it was the end goal that the beginning was the first advance from you see the end is not just the very last point in the process the, the, you know, the very instance that comes last in a, in, a, in a discernible length of a duration or a series, for example. You know, the end is not the last point. Because if you could say that, then there's no, you, you know, you, that can't be a standard for di discerning quality. It's a standard for discerning quantity. You can say, well, last point, okay? Well, there's always a last point in a quantitative measure. Otherwise, there is no last point. It goes forever. <laughs> And if there's a first point, there's always a last point because that first point could be the place where a process can initiate or the place from where a process, you know, degenerates or ends, ceases, in, you know, ceases, stops, stops existing, ceases into being. And so, to continue and not digress, the end is found in the beginning. Not because it is the last point. Because if it's the last point, then we can say, well, we can judge, the Greeks say this, that we can judge the quality, we can't judge the quality of a man's life by the, by the very last moment he, he lived. Because at the last moment he lived, man is always in his weakest state. You see, he's either old and frail or he either has an accident and died, you know? 
so so in order to have a proper assessment of a person's quality of life whether we say he lived a good life or a bad life is we actually can look at the overall totality of a man aristotle has one of my favorite quotes ever he says you can only truly ever know a man only once he is dead <laughs> Only once a man has died, you can truly know who he is. Because a man is an enduring substratum. He's constantly changing once, once, once he's alive. Once he's dead, he stops changing and you can see all the moments and all the variables in his life. You can, or, or, or rather abstractions of them. And say, well, he overall lived a good life. He did a... He, you know, he, he, he had a business, he helped a lot of people, blah, blah, blah. Or he was overall a bad person. He may have helped a few people here and there, but generally speaking, he was a bad man. He, he you know, he, he didn't live a well-flourishing existence. He, he was homeless, he had a lot of drugs, he abused people. He, he had a lot of hate and, and just discontent in his heart from the world. And the only person that suffered that discontent was himself. And he was projecting himself outwards exactly what he hates into his total, some of his total relations. He was expressing who he wants to not be, but who he has become to the total sum of his relations. And therefore his relations in turn interact with him in the manner which he set into being, you know? How you look at the world will in turn relates to how the world looks at you. Or how are you or how are you looked at by the world? <laughs> anyway. So from a quali from a qualitative um, assessment. You need the totality of the man's life to judge whether he lived a good or a bad existence. And, and who I am at this moment, I may not be in another moment. Even though I am the same substratum enduring the process. And this is why I am making these talks more than anything. It's to capture what I am right now in this moment. <laughs> and telling you my thought. It might remain the same, generally speaking, my whole life, but it will never remain what it is at every single particular instance. It's always changing. And those are the instances of your life. The objects of your life are always changing. You know, you can see the same bike every day, but microscopically, it's not the same bike every day. It's slowly degenerating into the opposite of its intended function, which initially was set out to do, carry you after wear and tear, it seizes and stops carrying you. And so from an entropical process, if a person begins with a purpose, the end point is always a digression, a complete digression away from that purpose. But that digression and the beginning is mediated by the advance or what actually took place from getting from one point, the beginning to the end, to the other point, you know? Um, what is the nature of the process? Did he digress, you know, throughout his entire life to the final digression of his from his purpose? Or did he actualize his purpose? And then finally at the last point, he had to digress because he just, you know, he just stopped, see, you know, stopped existing into being. He just changed, he, he transcended, he took on a different form, we can say, whatever you want to call it. That is where some element of free will comes in. You know, what will you determine? Now, you already determined, ultimately, in every way. <laughs> you are a height, length, certain weight, you know, certain look. You're going to generally be the same kind of environment, same kind of lifestyle. Generally speaking, your whole life you can go up and down. Or it can go really bad and just completely change into a worse or come go completely up and change into a really better lifestyle but the point is you're generally that subs substratum enduring the process that is being applied to you 
But there is determination in that. You see, what happens to you ultimately is determined is determined from this implicit point in you. You know, it's it's this point that you can actually choose to do well, and then when you do well, you just naturally fall, and then you fall, and you can stay falling and keep falling, or you can do a little bit better and go up. And 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 this is what Hegel means by dialectic. It is this organic process. And, and the reason why it has such a psychical component to it, why it is ultimately defined by mind, is because Hegel, like the Greeks, takes mind as a universal principle in the world. In fact, the entire universe is itself a mind. And in this mind, and I said this in 2017, <laughs> it's a video, in this mind, there are different conceptions of it. And there are different objects of it. Do you see? There are different objects of it. And these objects are inherently different from one another by not being the same thing. They take on a different form and function. But the form they take on is itself always the same substance. It's just an infinite flux of all possible qualities, not appearing and disappearing instantaneously, that's an abstraction of it, but existing eternally forever and the objects are taking on these qualities you see the first category in the dialectic is that two things are different from one another and that is their relation the second category in dialectic is that the relation itself is more fundamental than the categories that it takes on that constitute it you see the relation the interaction is more fundamental than the components that make it up if there's A and B, if there's a line, so let's say C divided uh, by A and B, C is more fundamental than A and B. Not in a chronological ordering system of quantity, but from a qualitative system of having the... Ex the, the, the entire the entire content itself be able to be arranged and disarranged in order to fit a particular meaning uh, express a particular narrative and hence the concept of dialectic why it's called dialectic it's a discourse it's 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 reaching some kind of conclusion of an argument that it has it has an internal argument with itself and it's reaching that internal argument and you are doing that with yourself and I am doing that with myself for you <laughs> I'm just doing it out loud and, and, and this constant dialectic is ongoing for all time 